Um, you need to know the dynamics of what happened when God called John the Baptist. It, it's profoundly important from a historical perspective, and I hope you'll come that night. There's a wonderful line that, uh, that Paul wrote uh, in the, to the Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. God sent Jesus, not haphazardly, but at the exact moment in history where it was optimum. Everything about the time of Jesus' birth, whether it's the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, you name it, it was vital that Jesus be born right then. And uh, this, this, I think of all the uh, series that we're doing, that, that's one of my favorite nights when we talk about Between the Testaments. Then we'll do the Gospels, then we'll do Acts and Romans, then we'll do the Pauline epistles, letters from Paul. When I first heard that word Pauline, I thought, well, I got an aunt Pauline. She never wrote anything to anybody. Why would they talk about her work in church? But it's Paul, the Apostle Paul. And then we'll do the other epistles, and then we'll close it up with Revelation. And so in the course of these... Um, of course, of these 12 nights, the six of the Old Testament and the six of the New, you should have a pretty good orientation, not in depth by any means, but at least a good orientation of the entire Bible, which would help you to read. The other day when I was preparing these notes, I came across a line from D.L. Moody, one of the great evangelists of yesteryear. And this is important to you. I want to read this out loud to you because what Moody wrote here is essential to every one of us. I prayed for faith. I thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. Before I didn't have faith, now I got faith. That's not the way it works. But faith did not seem to come. One day I read in the 10th chapter of Romans, now faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I had closed my Bible and prayed for faith. I now opened my Bible and began to study, and faith has been growing ever since. That is a profound statement. It's just really that simple. I'm so grateful for the great background my parents gave me in Sunday school and Bible training. Our church was good at that. And as a little kid, I, I learned those Bible stories. And I've told you this before, when I finally got to Bible college, frankly, it was kind of boring to me when it came to studying the actual Bible, because I'd learned all that stuff in Sunday school. As a little kid, and it formed a bulwark within me of stability that nothing in the whole world can, can equal. You need the Word of God. That's why we're doing this series. I, I just want to make it easier for you to read the Word of God and to assimilate it into your life. Because the way you get faith, I love Bill Gaither, but it's not by going to Bill Gaither concerts. The way you get faith is not by listening to Christian television. And we're on Christian television. The way you get faith that will really stay with you is by your studying the Word. Good time for all of you to say amen. amen. And by saying amen, you're saying, I'm going to read the word more than I've ever read it before. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, tonight we study the minor prophets in order of canon. That's the order of scripture. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Twelve great men in all, not minor because of the impact of their ministries, but minor only in the length of the books they left behind. Let's face it, Joel is a shorter book than Isaiah. So that's why they're called minor prophets. Wonderful paragraph there in the bottom of page one by Heschel. What manner of man is the prophet? And you can read this. Let's start with Hosea. God help us tonight as we study your word. If I were a motion picture producer, I would ask some brilliant playwright to give me a superb adaptation of the book of Hosea. I think it's without question the greatest love story I've ever read in my life. 
Hosea was a young man in uh, Israel who fell in love with and married a girl named Gomer. He loved her passionately. She bore him three children. But Gomer liked every man. And she went from one man to the next. She betrayed Hosea again and again. Until finally, she found herself sold into sexual slavery and disappeared. And some years later, a diseased, skeletal old hag, she was on an auction block waiting to be sold. And she heard the auctioneer. She's not worth much. She's sure been around, but you might be able to use her for something. Anyone bid on her? Anyone bid on her? And all of a sudden, Gomer heard a voice that she knew so well. I'll bid on her. She's magnificent to me. And she opened up her eyes and lifted her head. And there stood her husband, Hosea. And he bought her back. It's an incredible love story. And God uses it to point out what's happening with Israel. She had been the wife. God had been the husband. And God had given to her and given to her and given to her. And she proved the harlot with lover after lover. Idolatry. The great sin of Israel was idolatry. There's no sin God hates more than idolatry. Which is the consideration of himself to be anything other than he really is. That's why you need to know the word. Only by reading the word can you ever know who God really is. Nothing breaks God's heart quite as quickly as idolatry. Adultery is the sexual physical sin that equates spiritual idolatry. It's forsaking your lover for someone else. And in the spiritual case, it's forsaking the one who loves you more than anyone has ever loved you and given himself for you on the cross and throwing him over for some other lover that's idolatry. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That was the great sin of Israel. And God said that just as Hosea still loved Gomer and pursued her even there in the slave market and brought her back, so God continues to pursue the one who has betrayed him over and over and over again. It's an incredible story. It'd make a great movie. Why, why don't some of you cough up some money so we can make that great movie? Wouldn't that be a great movie? Hosea was a native of Israel. You'll note from, and I included this on back page again, it's in two or three sets of your notes, the chronological kings of the divided kingdom. That's such a tremendous help to you in your study. And I want you to refer to it over and over again. I have this pasted in my Bible. That's how important I think it is. Because I refer to it all the time. I can't remember. Dave Thomas can tell you I can't remember anything. I can't remember lyrics and anything. But, so I keep this in the back of my Bible all the time. And it will help you in this study again tonight. Hosea was called by God. This is number two on page two. To prophesy to the crumbling kingdom of Israel. Now... Here is the key date. You must remember this date. Remember when you went to history classes and teachers said, well, tonight I'm going to give you 4,000 dates. I want you to remember these dates. It just used to drive me crazy. Until finally I met Dr. Dwayne Meyer, the great teacher at Missouri State in world history, who said, I don't care if you learn the dates or not. When you learn about the people, the dates will just fall off your tongue like, and they did. And uh, the date I want you to remember because it's so vital to all we're doing in the Old Testament is 586 B.C. 586 B.C. 
What happened in 586 BC? I'm getting discouraged here, people. What happened 586 BC? Babylon invaded what? Jerusalem, and did what to Jerusalem? Destroyed it. And for the next decades, the Jews were in captivity, also called exile. So the pivotal date here is 586 BC, and after that comes that 70 year time of exile. Now we're studying 12 prophets tonight, called minor prophets, just because of the length of their books. Nine of these lived before the Babylonian invasion, and three were post-exile, after the exile. And we'll get to them, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi. They were the post ones. So remember the first nine we're going to study ministered to Israel and Judah before Assyria destroyed Israel to the north and Babylon destroyed Judah to the south. Is that confusing? I hope it isn't confusing to you. 586 is the key phrase here. Um, the purpose, number four, the purpose of the book of Hosea was God's last attempt to call Israel to repentance from her flagrant idolatry before just giving her over to a serious brutal subjugation. On your chart, you'll see on the right side of the page that the Assyrians came down and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in uh, 721 BC. Judah, the southern kingdom, and Jerusalem lasted over a century longer. Now, Hosea, you see Hosea there on the right side of the page by number 13, Jeroboam II. Jeroboam was a bad king. How many of the kings of Israel were bad? All of them. They were really consistent. They never had a winner. And Hosea ministers to the nation of Israel under the reign of Jeroboam II, 782 to 753. Jeroboam reigned for 41 years, and Hosea falls in that time during which he's begging the country, turn back to the one who really loves you. Stop playing the harlot with the world. You may be saying, we've sinned too much. God can't love us anymore. God will always love you. God will always reach out to you. As long as there's breath coming out of your lungs. Come back to God. Turn back to the one who loves you. The outline is number five there. Chapters one to three describe Hosea's marriage to Gomer. The names of their three children were very prophetic signs to Israel. The first son was Jezreel, which means God scatters. Number two, the second child was Lo Rahama, not loved. The third child was Lo Ami, not my people. Then chapter four through 14 contain a series of prophecies by Hosea that parallel Israel's unfaithfulness to that of his wife. It's a great book, Hosea. I love to read Hosea. Okay, now Joel. Joel is a pivotal book to us Pentecostals, you know, because in his second chapter, he prophesied that in the last days, uh, in the last days there would come a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we're in those days. Joel ministered in Judah in and around Jerusalem. And during this time, a uh, terrible calamity had befallen Judah in two forms, drought and then plagues of locusts. Um, I don't know how much you've ever read about the ancient locust plagues. You think, what's that, a bug? I mean, what is that? Plagues of locusts were some of the most devastating things to ever happen to humanity. I should have brought it in, but I've got a number of books on, on locust plagues. They would, these locusts would come in by the kajillion, billion, zillions, until they looked like clouds of dust sweeping across the prairie. They were not, it was not dust, it was locusts. And they would eat everything in their path. If they'd come to a river, they would throw themselves in the river and die 
until their dead bodies formed a bridge over which the living locusts could continue on. They were relentless. Down near uh, Bethlehem is a little town of Tekoa. It's right between Bethlehem and the Herodian, a little town of Tekoa. There is in actual recorded history the story of the locusts coming in across that valley and people fleeing and a little child was left behind and the locust ate it right down to the bone. So when we talk about lo a, a plague of locusts here, don't just say, well, you know, just bugs. Deadly. They were killers. Any, anything in their path they would kill. And now all around Jerusalem, those of you who've been to Israel with me, all around Jerusalem, all of that rich agricultural area, all around Jerusalem that is so fertile today had been destroyed by some years of drought and by these locusts until there's nothing left. And one day this prophet Joel is making his way from Jerusalem out to a little town uh, just west of there. Forget the name of the little town, but he's on his way out. And he's praying, oh God, look at this. The whole landscape is denuded. Everything has been eaten. It's devastation. Oh God, will anything ever happen? God told him to proclaim a sacred assembly. We'll talk about that in a moment where the people would come and repent of their sins and ask God to heal their land. And God said, don't despair. This is not the end of the road. It looks terrible out there, Joel, but this is not the end. There's going to come a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now at the top of page three, under the word Joel, I've written this out for you. The 50 days that followed our Lord's death on Calvary were spectacular ones. Three days after his death, Jesus rose from the grave. A few days later, he ascended from Mount Olive to heaven. On the 50th day after Passover, the day Jesus died, on the 50th day during the annual Jewish day of harvest called Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the 120 seeking followers of Christ on Mount Zion. They changed the world. The outpouring was so spectacular that en route to the temple, crowds of people were asking, what is it with these people? They must be drunken. I mean, nobody ever acts like this. And from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you. Hearken to my words. These are not drunken, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day, which would have been about noon. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass, this is in his second chapter of Joel. It shall come to pass, in the last days saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That does not mean tell the future. We're not talking about Dionne Warwick here in some spooky TV show. And why anybody would have ever called Dionne Warwick for advice about the future is beyond me because that poor lady didn't even know the way to San Jose. <laughs> and yet people would call her all the time. Shall come to pass, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That means anointedly tell about Jesus Christ. The ultimate gift of prophecy is anointed foretelling. Now we're living in a day when every guy and his dog calls themselves a prophet and they come on television and say, God's told me to tell you this is your future. I don't buy into that even for a second. Because the Bible says there's no mediator between me and God except Jesus Christ. So if Jesus wants to tell me something, why is he sending Melvin? He'll tell me, God's spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. Somebody may come along and corroborate it and encourage me, but there's no mediator between you and God. So stop going to these conventions to have somebody prophesy over you. Everything God wants you to know is in his word and his Holy Spirit will confirm in your spirit as you seek him 
what he wants you to know. Christianity is becoming very spooky in America. Prophecy, the ultimate sense of prophecy is the anointed foretelling of God. Now there are times on special occasions when God's mind will be revealed in somebody. This is more on the, this is more of the gift of knowledge than it is the gift of prophecy. When God will tell somebody something's going to happen in the future, get ready. That has happened. But by and large, the gift of prophecy is anointed witnessing, which every one of you should have if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, who said that, Pastor? Uh, let me try to remember. Uh, oh, yeah, Jesus said that. Acts 1.8, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses. This is the ultimate use of prophecy. Anointed forth telling of the word of God. And every Pentecostal ought to be doing that because that's what the baptism is for. God didn't give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit just to speak in tongues, and I believe in tongues. I believe it's the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the reason the baptism is given to us is to be anointed witnesses for Jesus. That's the ultimate sense of prophecy. So, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dreams. There's a difference between those two, and I've told you about this before. Dreams are those things that God gives people about things that could be. Vision is the implementation of that dream. How do you do that? Well, we just go into a trance. We go into a trance and suddenly, doo -doo -doo -doo, God begins, my Lord people, that's why God gave you a brain. Gave you a brain, he expects you to use it. Is this on? Hello? <laughs> you out there? And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in, my, uh, in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So the book of Joel and his wondrous prophecy, 800 years before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, happened on the day of Pentecost. It was corroborated by the apostle Peter and they're precious to us who are Pentecostal. Uh, number two on page three, Joel's purpose for writing this book were to bring the people together before the Lord in a great sacred assembly. He calls for it several times. Joel 1.14, sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land, cry unto the Lord. In chapter two, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. To exhort, to encourage the people. Anytime you hear about exhorting, it means encouraging. Exhort means encourage. Encourage the people to repent. Humbly return to the Lord God and to prophesy happier days are ahead. Uh, on page four in the box there, the fastest growing spiritual phenomenon in the world today is not Islam. There are some major cracks occurring in Islam. You watch what's going to happen here. We, we tend to think, boy, this huge monolithic religion out there, it's just getting so big. That's the way you thought about the Soviet Union and communism 20 years ago. God took care of that. God will take care of this. Be not dismayed, whate'er betide. God will take care of you. And the fastest growing spiritual phenomenon is not Islam. It's not the Roman Catholic Church. It's Pentecostals. In fact, there are a lot of Pentecostals in the Roman Catholic Church. It's conservatively estimated that today there are between 500 million and 600 million Pentecostal people in the world. And that figure is growing so rapidly that we now believe within the next decade, Pentecostalism could hit the one billion mark. Think of that. And it doesn't have to be enforced at the point of a gun. No ism that has to be enforced at the point of a gun or a sword is going to last for a long time because people won't put up with it. Read your history books. Only those things that come out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living 
water. Let me give you an illustration of that. We talked about this at staff meeting Monday. <clears throat> I've never been a part of, of the political right or the religious right because I'm just not sold on it. That's not the way to influence people for Christ. It's the love of Christ. Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me, not beating him on the head with a sign. The love of Christ constrains me. I remember a few years ago, I was getting some phone calls from some preachers who said, uh, we need to start uh, picketing all of these adult nightclubs around town where they do the nude dancing. We're going to get these pickets. And we're going to start marching around these nightclubs. And, and um, I said, no, I don't think we're going to do that. And I didn't have the heart to tell them, but in my own heart, I thought that's about the most stupid thing I ever heard in my life. Because here you are, you're out there, uh, you're out there with your picket sign at night, and you're marching around this place. And, uh, you know, down with this place, it's, uh, de it's demonic, it's unfair to women, and so on and so forth. Who's going to show up? Who's going to show up for your demonstration? Channel 2. Channel 5, Channel 8, Channel 14, however many channels you've got in town, they'll all be there with their cameras and taking pictures of you. So you're going to be on the 6 o'clock news, and there you are, marching around this nightclub with your sign. And out there watching in television land is this old boy. He's got a Budweiser in his hand, and he's watching you. And he says, well, look at that. I didn't even know this place existed until First Assembly pointed out to me. Why do you think God gave us a brain, people? So our women's ministries, Connie got it started and then Jeannie Turner took it over. They've invaded these places with love. Well, one of these dancers, we, I got a birthday card last year signed by 32 of these gals that have come out of the clubs have been saved now. 32 of these gals. That's something. And uh, the, the card just said, thank you for believing in us so much you'd send somebody to rescue us. Rescue the perishing, not beat them over the head. Who needs to be beat over the head? So not too long ago, one of these dancers was murdered. And Jeannie said, Pastor, can we have the uh, funeral here in the church? And I said, sure. And I was going out of the country, but, but uh, Connie and Jeannie and some of the pastors helped to do this. I think they had it over in the chapel. And it was packed. All kinds of people there. And um, folks were stunned. Why, why would First Assembly do this? Because Jesus would do this. That's why. And uh, so the other day, Jeannie called me. She had to tell me this. The other day, she went back to one of the main clubs in town. I won't tell you which one because you don't need to know. Huh? She went into this club, and there's no dancers there. She said to the owner, where are the dancers? He said, they're gone. Every one of them had been at the funeral at First Assembly and felt the love of the Master. It just seems to me it's so simple, people. The thing about Jesus that was so incredible was that he loved people. And he touched them, he didn't bang them around. He loved them, he picked them up. He was always someone who picked people up, loved them, encouraged them. You know how missing that is in society today? How desperately missing that is? Just thought I'd bring that to your attention here tonight. We're growing very rapidly, thank God. No matter how hard Satan and his cohorts fought this sovereign move of God that Joel wrote about, he was unable to dislodge in humanity what the Holy Spirit had begun. 
At the outbreak of the 20th century, about 105 years ago, the fire broke out once again. Today, well over a half billion people are seeing the result of Joel's remarkable prophecy. I went with uh, Peter Kuzmich over to Bosnia. Remember the war in Bosnia? About 15 years ago, 12 years ago maybe. Terrible war. I mean, unbelievable war. Genocidal. And Peter asked me to go, and the week after the ceasefire, which he helped to engineer, by the way, we went over to Bosnia. Couldn't believe it. Beautiful places like Sarajevo, the great city of the Winter Olympics a few years ago. It was absolute rubble. It looked like Nuremberg after World War II. Mostar, uh, other places, just horrible. And I was there, saw it. One of the first things you saw was that there are improvised cemeteries everywhere in, in people's lawns, on the courtyards of, of uh, courthouses, in the, in the yards, improvised cemeteries. So many died. And you hardly saw any men between the ages of 18 and 30. They were dead because of this devastation. It was terrible. So Peter and, and his AG cohorts went in there, and what they did was opened up massive warehouses of food and clothing. No questions asked. and just started to feed people, clothe people. They didn't interrogate them. They didn't care who they were, whether they were Serbians or communists or Bosnians or who it didn't matter, Albanians coming up from the south. They didn't care. They just took care of them. And uh, we were called over there because now people were wanting to know about this Jesus who cared about them. Churches sprang up everywhere. You built, you built two of them. You built the one in Mostar and you built the one in Tuzla. You built it. This church built those churches. It came out of the fact that people just cared enough to love. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. He is enormously magnetic and attractive. Okay, I get going on that, I'll be here all night. Amos is the next one. Bottom of page four, he was an eighth century BC prophet a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah in the southern kingdom of Judah. He ministered roughly the same time period as his counterparts Jonah and Hosea in the northern kingdom. He was a herdsman from the village of Tekoa. Um, when Amos ministered, bottom of page four, at this point in history, Israel, the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom only had a couple of decades of existence left. You see Amos there in, under Jeroboam's reign on your chart, around the year down to 753, which meant they were down to 20 years of existence left because the Assyrians wiped them out in 721. And Amos was begging the people to get right with God. Now, the strange thing is, at this point in Israel, the northern kingdom's history, 20 years away from oblivion, she was rich. She wasn't in, de in uh, depression. She wasn't in loss. Israel was rich, fabulously rich. And the richer she got, who needs God? I got everything I need. Who needs God? And the people rejected out of hand, Amos cry, repent or perish. And the prophet was expelled from the northern country. He returned down south to Judah and committed his message, the book of Amos, to writing. His hope was to get a copy to wicked King Jeroboam, north in Israel, and to spread the message to the common man as well. Israel's primary sins included idolatry, immorality, and injustice. This thing of justice is a big thing to God, by the way. It's a big, big thing to God. Probably next to idolatry, injustice, is on his anger list. Obadiah is the next one, Obadiah. Um, God had made, a, this is a fascinating book. Obadiah is a little bit different thing here. He was just, he was just, he was just giving God's message to a specific group of people, the people down in Edom. Edom is that nation southeast of the Dead Sea. We were in Edom uh, uh, last May when we went to Petra. Those of you who went to Petra with me, that's Edom. 
That's the land of the Nabataeans. That's Esau's country. That's Edom. Now here's what happened. This fascinating story. Look under Obadiah, number one. God made a promise to Abraham, as Abram as he was then called, when he commanded him to leave Ur of Chaldea, which is Iraq, and journey to a far country who knew not of, which would become later Israel, Canaan. This is the promise from Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land I'll show you. And I'll make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Look at verse 3. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Read your history books, people. Just read your history books. Every civilization, every nation that has been kind to the seed of Abraham, the Jew, has flourished. Every nation that has been unkind to the Jew has perished. Look it up. It's just there. For thousands of years, it's there. Shouldn't be hard for anybody to learn. Now, this tiny one-chapter book of Obadiah shows that God meant business because 1,100 years after God made the promise to Abraham, the children of Israel were traipsing from Egypt to the promised land, going across the Sinai. And they'd crossed over to the east bank of the Jordan and they wanted to go through Edom, Petra, to get to the Jordan to cross over at a specific time. The Edomites said, no, you cannot. You'll have to go clear around us, which cost them probably years of travel. Now, God said he's going to repay the Edomites for their shabby treatment of the Jews when they were going to the promised land from Egypt. Edomites were the descendants of Esau, but they were always bitter enemies of the Jews. And I've noted it for you here in Numbers chapter 20. This is the top of page 6. Numbers 20, verse 14. Moses, Moses, this goes back now in history. A scriptural history. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel. A friendly message. Thou knowest all the travail that's befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt. We dwelt in Egypt a long time in slavery, 400 years as a matter of fact. The Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. When we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we're in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, we ask you, through your country. We will not pass through the fields, nor through the vineyards. We will not drink the water out of your wells. We will go by the king's highway, which we were, that's, the, that's the road we drove up on the bus last May, people, the king's highway. We will go up the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand or to the left until we've passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, we'll pay you for it. I will only without doing anything else go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. Now, a thousand years later, God said, Payback time, Edom. You had a chance to bless the Jews and you cursed them. Payback time. The Edomites had not only turned Israel away, they had plundered Jerusalem four times under the reigns of Jehoram, Amaziah, Ahaz, and Zedekiah. And now through Obadiah, God told the Edomites it was time to pay the cost for their ill treatment of the Jews. Wow. Read that, United Nations, and weep. Page seven, Jonah. Jonah. You know the story of Jonah. Many times during the war in Iraq, we have watched the network news to see action near the Iraqi town of Mosul. How many times have you seen Mosul on CNN and Fox and so forth? Just one mile east from Mosul, across the Tigris River, lie the ruins of ancient Nineveh. In Jonah 3.3, 3, Nineveh is called an exceeding great city. It's an understatement. Archaeologists have learned from the city's walls, temples, palaces, inscriptions, and reliefs, even in their ruined condition, how magnificent this city was. Probably a city of about 600,000 people in Jonah's time. 
Long before Jonah's time, Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, had a reputation for being ruthless and cruel. You read the king's report there, I cut their heads off, I burned them with fire, etc. So God, number three, God had decided to destroy Nineveh and told Jonah to go to that wicked city and warn its inhabitants. Jonah didn't want to go. Why? Because Jonah hated him. And he knew that if he went there and preached the word, they'd probably repent and God would spare them. <laughs> and later on, when God did spare him, it just made Jonah mad. So he didn't want to go. And he decided to run away. Paul, let's show that little clip. Here's about a two minute clip of Joppa. Instead of going north and east up to Nineveh, Jonah goes down to Joppa, which at that time was the only seaport town in Israel. It's the south end of Tel Aviv. And boarded a ship to go to Tarshish, which was on the coast of old Spain. It was the Sanibel Island of the Mediterranean at that time. He's gonna run away from God. And just to show you the place where it happened, let's just run that little clip real quick, okay? He began near the ancient city of Joppa, which became famous for one man's disobedience to God. I want you to turn on the screen of your imagination and I want you to try to imagine something. Here's this beautiful bay behind me. This is the extreme eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. The city is Tel Aviv, which is a fairly new city. It's not even a hundred years old yet. Great city here in Israel. But I want you to go back about 2,500 years, okay? And I want you to imagine a ship, a great sailing ship, headed out, going west on the Mediterranean here. It's headed for Spain. It's headed for a place called Tarshish. And on board that ship is a runaway preacher. His name is Jonah. He's decided to run away from God. And the reason for that is because God had told him, go to Nineveh, way up to the north, the Nineveh of the Assyrians, where they were so wicked and anathema to anything godly. And God said to Jonah, you go up there and warn those people to repent because judgment's coming. Well, you know the story. Jonah said, I'm not going to go. And they headed out in the Mediterranean. I don't know how far out they were when suddenly there was this big wind and the sea began to be in turmoil and the sailors thought they were going to lose everything. And finally, Jonah said, listen, I'm the culprit here. Throw me over and you'll be all right. And sure enough, that's what happened. And you know how the great fish came along and swallowed Jonah and finally pitched him out way up on the coastline of Turkey somewhere where he made, where he made his way to, uh, to Nineveh. It's an amazing story and I absolutely believe the story is true for all kinds of reasons. But the lesson's very clear. Whatever God has called you to do in life, you have to do. You cannot run away from God's call on your life. He will stop you. God will stop you one way or the other. Okay. Let's go to page eight, Micah. Not only is the history of Micah's prophecy a fascination to Bible students, but here's one of the cases where Micah did foretell the future. He said that Jesus, the company didn't use the word Jesus, he said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And we see the fulfillment of this um, hundreds of years later. Micah, Micah lived 740 to 732 under the reign of good King Jotham in Judah. That's on your chart. So uh, 700 and some years later, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Matthew writes. In the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. They probably came from Iran, maybe Iraq. We don't know how many there were. Uh, somebody asked me a good question the other day. I think, Darlene, you sent me this email. Um, if the wise men saw the star in the east, why did they travel west to get there? Is that the question? Because they saw the star in the east. That's where they were. They were in the east. In the east, they saw a star. The star happened to be going west. 
and they followed it, which of course took them to Israel. And they said, where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, we saw his star. We've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled <laughs> and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and the prophet was Micah. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So Micah ministered in the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Jotham and Hezekiah were good kings. Ahaz was very wicked. His message to Jerusalem and Judah was about their sins, their future destruction, and their ultimate restoration. And there you've got a brief outline of it. Go to page 9. Nahum. Jonah and Nahum had one thing in common, Nineveh. Jonah first came to Nineveh with his message to repent, which resulted in revival. But later on, a hundred years later, Nineveh is wicked again, and Nahum came to say, God's done with you now. He's not gonna come to you again. Genesis 3, 6, 6, 3 says, my spirit will not always strive with man. We don't know a whole lot about Nahum. Some people believe, I'm not sure this is right, but some people believe that the little town on the north end of the Sea of Galilee was named after him, Capernaum, Kafir Nahum. Kafir means village, Nahum would have been the name of the man. But we don't know for sure that it was that Nahum, although Nahum probably came from that basic area, could have been. And Kafir Nahum, Capernaum, became Jesus' headquarters city when he ministered for three years. Uh, you can read the rest of that. Habakkuk, I love Habakkuk because in this book, in this book comes the great championship rallying call for the faith. The just shall live by faith. Sometime around 625 BC, the Babylonians were sweeping the known nations with their massive armies, but they hadn't yet reached Judah and Jerusalem. Habakkuk has an argument with God. This is fun reading. Why would Judah perish at the hands of the Babylonians? First of all, they were the chosen people. How can you use, God, a more wicked nation than Judah is as an instrument of your judgment? God's response was that he would also judge Babylon in his time. So Habakkuk 2.4 became the great rallying cry, not only then, but later on for Martin Luther in the Reformation 500 years ago, the just shall live by faith. Now go back 500 years ago and start to read your Martin Luther and Calvin books and so forth and begin to read about the Reformation. 500 years ago, you were justified by indulgences. You'd come to my office on Friday and you'd say, Pastor Betzer, uh, I'm going to really have a wild party tomorrow night. I got seven women, 82 cases of booze, and uh, five or six rolls of pornography. And I'm really going to have a big party tomorrow night. What do you figure that's going to cost me to keep me saved? And I say to you, oh boy, that's bad. That's going to be probably be about $8,000. You say, okay, and you shell out the $8,000, then go live like hell. That's what was going on 500 years ago. And people would say, well, I bought the indulgence, I'm okay. And Martin Luther finally blew his stack. He said, what? What are you doing? We're not saved by this. We're not saved even because the church says we are. We are saved by faith. Faith that changes the way you live, the way you think. And he was the one who rallied Habakkuk's great cry, the just shall live by faith. You're not saved by how you feel. So we've sung, look what the Lord has done. Mm -hmm. I love that song. I do. I, I've had you sing it a dozen times. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body and my mind. He changed me just in time. Oh, I feel good. Whoopee. I didn't mean you're saved. Means you like the song. What are you saved by? Faith. In what? 
2,000 years ago, my Lord Jesus, with my sins in his body because he drank the cup of my sins, was nailed on that cross, and my sins were nailed there with him, and that's the end of the story. Thank you very much. That's why I'm saved. That's what the gospel is. Doesn't matter how you feel. Quartets used to sing, I woke up this morning feeling fine. Woke up with heaven on my mind. And Martin Luther said, Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. I woke up this morning feeling fine. How you felt when you woke up this morning and a buck will get you a cup of coffee. I'm saved because I know what Jesus did for me. And Satan will come against you and lie to you. And you'll say, oh, the devil's been after me all day. So what? Remind him of where he's going. I'm saved because of what Jesus did, not by how I feel. And I accept him, and by faith I cling to him. He is my faith. He is my salvation. The Lord is my defense. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, that's Habakkuk. Boy, I could get going on Habakkuk. Zephaniah. How are we doing? Zephaniah prophesied in the days of good King Josiah. What a wonderful king he was. Zephaniah was the great, great grandson of Hezekiah, hence related to Josiah as well. Josiah ruled after the reign of Manasseh, arguably the most despicable of all Jewish kings, who brought about an excellent reformation in his nation. Zephaniah was very instrumental in that move toward God. However, God knew that the paradise was to be short-lived, and within a few decades, disaster would strike Judah. The sins that Zephaniah cites in this prophecy indicate the book was written prior to Josiah's ascent to the throne. You can read about that. For the most part, number three down there, for the most part, the book is a sober warning about the coming day of God's judgments for sin. And uh, Jesus referred to that. Okay, now go to page 11. I'm sorry I got to go so quickly, but you've been talking so much I haven't had a chance here. Haggai, and we now come to the post-exile. These are the three prophets who ministered after the Jews were coming back from Babylon. And they're heroes, well they all are, but boy, these post-exile guys were something. Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi, the other two. Some scholars believe that Haggai, this is number one, believe that Haggai could have been one of a small handful of exiles who returned to resettle Jerusalem who had lived there before Babylon came. So that means Haggai must have been an old guy, maybe 80. He had been there in the golden days of Jerusalem, the great temple of Solomon. And then the Babylonians came in and absolutely decimated everything. And for the past decades, he had been one of the captives in Jerusalem. Now he's coming home. Boy, I can see these guys coming up over the rise and seeing what was once the great city of Jerusalem. You folks who've been there with me know when we come over that rise on the bus and we start to see Jerusalem and we hear Larry Ford singing on the bus sound system, Jerusalem, oh God, you just sit there and cry. But think of what it must have been like when they came back from exile and they came up over that rise and there's nothing there but rubble. You talk about gutty people, boy. Haggai. We know when he lived because it says so in Haggai 1.1 in the second year of Darius the king, who was the Persian. Here again, you need to know your history. It was the Persians who defeated the Babylonians. Ah, you have to read that one for yourself. Zechariah. I do want you to study this, and it should help you as you read the book. There are little outlines there for you for each book to help you read. Zechariah was a younger co-contemporary with Haggai. His prophecy concerned the rebuilding of the temple, forecasts of the grander future temple, visions of the coming Messiah and the coming universal kingdom of God. According to the New Testament, Zechariah was later murdered in Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of uh, Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Uh, particular stunning verses here. Uh, go to the book of Acts. This is the top of page 13. In the book of Acts, when Jesus ascended back to the Father, 
While they watched him go, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, two men, angels, stood by them in white apparel, said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Zechariah prophesied this. Hasn't happened yet. This hasn't happened yet. But it will. Zechariah 14, 3, 4. This is the top of page 13. The Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet, this is the second coming of Christ. And gang, you're going to be there. If you're a born again believer, you're going to be there. You're going to be a part of this. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. <coughs> and there shall be a very great valley. Half the mountain shall remove toward the north, half of it toward the south. I intend to see that. That's going to be so great. <clears throat> That's going to be so great. My old friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey, old crusty old Jew in Jerusalem, who was uh, the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia Judaica. And he was one of the... Uh, <clears throat> one of the curators of Yad Vashem, the Museum of the Holocaust. Great man. He looked like Einstein. He had the long hair, you know. I, going to bleed out of job. I loved him. He died when he was in his 80s. It's a shame. One of the great men of Israel. I'm at his house having dinner one day. <clears throat> and doctor, I've told you this before, but it's such a good story. I told this at synagogue, Temple, temple uh, Judea one night brought the house down. I said, um, no Dr. Wigator looked at me over coffee and he says, you know, Dad, not a whole lot of difference between Jews and evangelical believers. He said, we both believe in Messiah, right? I said, you're not kidding, Dr. Wigator, we sure do. He said, the only difference is, you think he's already been here once. We don't think he's got here yet. I said, that's it. That is the big difference. He said, well, we both know he's coming, don't we? Because the old prophet Zechariah said so. Looked at his money, he said, he's going to land right up there on top of Mount of Olives. I said, that's what Ze Zechariah said, and that's what it says in the book of Acts. He says, I know that. He said, that's going to be someday, don't you think? Messiah comes down, lands on that mountain, and splits in two going to be able to see clear down to the Dead Sea from right here. I said, that's right. He said, uh, you know there's going to be a big press conference when Messiah comes. I said, no question about it. You'll be there, Gene, for this one. He says, he says, well, when the press conference happens, I get to ask the first question. He said, you don't live in Jerusalem, and I do. So he said, you can ask a later question. I said, okay. What's your first question going to be? He said, I'm going to look up at Messiah and say, Sir, tell me, is this your first trip to Jerusalem? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Page 13, Malachi, the last of the post exile prophets of God, a contemporary. Not the, well, he's contemporary of Nehemiah. Nehemiah came back to rebuild the temple. Remember that? That's in the historical books. That's in your notes. Nehemiah. When Malachi wrote this prophecy, the post-exilic Jews in the Holy Land were again experiencing adversity and decline. Boy, you can, if you can just use your imagination on this one, coming back to that rubble of Jerusalem, trying to rebuild it. Because of their situation, the people doubted God's provision had become hard and cynical. The worship of the Lord became mechanical and sensitive. So Malachi confronted both the priests and the people with the charge to repent of their attitudes and their religious hypocrisy and to remove the obstacles of disobedience that were blocking God's favor. The book consists of a sixfold burden of the Lord intermingled with 10 rhetorical and very sarcastic questions by Israel and God's response to them. And number four, Malachi's teachings on offerings and on tithe are vital to the church. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. 
that there may be meat in my house. The storehouse is where you get your spiritual food. Somebody called from one of the satellites the other day, talked to Brad, and uh, kind of uh, been out of shape that uh, something was not happening in that satellite, which was a very expensive thing to have done if we could have done it. But we didn't do it because it's expensive. We don't have the money. She said, well, I just think, you know, if you're going to send money to China and all these other places, you ought to do this. Brad said, can I ask you a question? He said, you may be right, but can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. He said, are you a tither? Long silence on the phone. She said, well, let me explain that. Brad said, please, you know, I'd like to hear. She said, we have a good salary, but she said, there's a family in town that my husband and I are trying to help, and what would be our tithe we give to that family? Brad said, that's wonderful of you to do that. You do that with uh, Florida Power and Light? What? He said, when, when you get a bill from Florida Power and Light, you call them and say, well, we're not going to send it in to you because we're helping this family down the street. After three months, they're going to shut your power off. You have a mortgage on your house? Yeah. You call the bank and say, well, the reason we're not paying our mortgage is we're sending some money to the Red Cross this month. We're doing it in your name, though. Is that what you're doing to God? Your tithe belongs to the house of God. Where you get your food. That's what the Bible says. And God says, further, when you do it, I'll bless you. I'll bless you. He said, now, <clears throat> the reason why this is not happening in your satellite probably is because you and maybe several others aren't paying tithe. So he said, tonight, if you're fair and honest, he said, I think you ought to sit down with your family over dinner and say, listen, the reason we don't have this in our church is because we're robbing God. Hello. <laughs> What's the truth? You're the most giving people in the world, but I'll tell you the truth. In a church this size, if everybody paid tithe, <laughs> You know what we could do for God? It would stagger you. I have no idea who gives what. I have never looked at the books in the whole 19 years I'm here. But I know in a church that has over 4,000 people in it on Sunday morning that the tithe must be just breathtaking. Old Dr. Powell, old Dr. Powell, young Dr. Powell, over at McGregor Baptist, I heard him preaching one morning. He said, he said, you know, McGregor Baptist has never been robbed in its history. Nobody's ever broken here and robbed this church any day of the week, except Sunday. <laughs> so that's the minor prophets, and now we are ushered into a period for us that will last about four weeks, but in history it lasted for 400 years. And between now and the time we meet again for the New Testament for dummies, the Medo-Persian Empire is going to collapse. The Greeks are going to rise, come and go under Alexander, and then his four generals who succeeded him. And then the Romans are going to come alive, and Pompey is going to go riding into the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. And Julius Caesar is going to be assassinated on the Ides of March. Mark Antony is going to fall in love with Cleopatra, who looks like Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> and an old priest is going to go into the temple in Jerusalem one day. He's an old priest. So his name's Elizabeth. His name is Zachariah. God's going to say to him, Zachariah, what? Your wife, Elizabeth? Yeah, the old woman down there at Karim. She's pregnant. Oh. John the Baptist. 
that's coming along. It's a great story, isn't it? Okay, I, oh my goodness, I'm sorry I went so long. Stand up.